And it was realised that we could make history to navigate Queen Victoria all the way up the Amazon. Do, do you just naturally have sea legs? There was no steering wheel. Well, you see, what, exactly. 360, 360 degrees? 360 degrees, 360 degrees, degrees rotation. Plus the ships are very big, plus yeah. they're fully stabilised. The so at the sharp end. end. Yeah, at the exactly. sharp end. Yeah. We Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dubious Engineering. This is Captain Peter Philpott, one of the most prestigious captains um, in the world. He's captain, uh, was retired now, sorry, is captain of the Queen Mary II and the Queen Victoria from Cunard Line and many other ships. And Peter has very kindly agreed to join us today on the show to sit down and talk about some of the statistics of these boats and the, how to navigate them, the engineering side of things, and and all of the, the good stuff that is involved in these incredible floating towns, as you call them. Yeah, indeed they are, yeah. And you're also my brother-in-law as well. I've forgotten about that. This is my brother-in-law too. <laughs> as it happens. <laughs> How many years at sea? As you said, I've just mm. recently taken, can I say, early retirement. Yes. <laughs> make, yes let's indeed. make that point. Clear, However, yeah. Yeah. I, it was uh, partly to do with the fact that I realised a while ago that I'd soon have 40 years in at sea. So... So 40 years uh, from that early age, um, I felt was a really good innings. Yeah. And um, I got to where I wanted to be. Indeed. And yeah. I thought, well, I'll, yeah. uh, maybe it's time to quit while I'm ahead and then, you know, enjoy a different life. I never imagined I'd, um, I'd end up as captain of the Queen Mary II, which is the flagship of the British Merchant Navy. So, um, you know, probably the most prestigious ship to be captain on, as you say. So I could have never dreamed it. So it just shows where it can take you if you work hard and, you know, you have a a little bit of perhaps good fortune and end up in the right place at the right time. time. Yeah. So I thought, yeah. well, you know, I can't go any, where, where can I go from here? So, so I thought, yeah, time to, uh, yeah, quit yeah. it after, yeah. after all those years at sea. Well, now you've quit it, mm. what are you up to? Well, I'm, I'm enjoying being at home because of course when you're at sea, you know, um, I should, should say really, I mean, some of those, uh, first contracts on the ships were up to six months long, you know, six months away from home. Um, you know, it's lovely to travel the world and, and I loved it, but um, you know, it's also nice to be home. Um, we did used to get a nice uh, leave period um, around two months really at home sometimes, which was lovely, yeah. but there was always yeah. that going back. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah. so when you're retired, it's like being on leave, but the uh, instructions to rejoin a ship never come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never found, I've never found um, it a problem finding things to do either at home. And I'm, I'm that way now, I'm glad to say. My understanding is you're pretty busy. Yeah. Um, and, and not only just busy with personal life, but um, I, I believe you're also uh, involved in some blog and uh, some work that you're doing for the world's greatest vacations. Exactly, yeah, and which is a website run by uh, a lovely gentleman called uh, Richard Shane, uh, based in New York. Um, of course, on the Queen Mary 2, our, our usual itinerary was mostly transatlantic crossings between Southampton and New York. So we used to be in New York every two weeks and uh, got to know a few people. Uh, he came on and interviewed me on the bridge of the Queen Mary too. And when he heard I was retiring, he said, um, "Well, one of the things I, I, you know, maybe we could get together. One of the things you could do is is maybe uh, write about your experiences, and and you know, we can publish it on on the website, the world's greatest vacations, which is a travel website. They're not a travel agent, but they they showcase various uh, high end travel companies such as Cunard." Uh, so I've been writing a, a column uh, for them uh, ever since I retired and uh, it, quite I was amazed myself really I suppose when you've had 40 years experience uh, there was no thinking what shall I write mm, it was yeah. like how can I keep it short enough to be what he wants because there's so much to say yes so, indeed uh, you yeah. know and stories to tell and and uh, you mentioned uh, to me uh, that that you had another opportunity that was popping up as well for the same I believe the same company that's right yeah through the world's greatest vacations one of the things that Richie said might happen is these uh, travel companies might um, be very interested in what I've been writing and uh, they might want me to do some writing for them as well so sure enough uh, an opportunity has popped up there so um, I'm very excited because uh, they uh, a small one ship cruise company called Paul Gogan Cruises who cruise the South Pacific Islands out of Tahiti 
have asked me to come on their ship for a 10 day voyage uh, with Dawn Marie, my wife and your my sister. sister. <laughs> I was very insistent we'll, that she we'll, had to we'll, come too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we'll make sure that she appears on the show in just a few seconds sure. as well. So, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and they've invited us along for a 10 day voyage in the South Pacific to write about them and, uh, and for them as well. So it just shows you where a few um, blogs or columns can take you actually, because uh, we're going to the South Pacific Islands now. And, uh, fantastic well what, what I'm going to do is obviously I'll put a link in the description section down below so that you can pop there and check out um, the world's greatest vacations now um, obviously this is an engineering show predominantly um, we've got quite a lot of different projects going on including building a, 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 a camper van out of a, a T6 panel van that I recently purchased um, but there are a few key questions that are in my mind mm. and I'd love to get an opportunity to ask you a few of these things far away so um, how long, <laughs> how long do, do you just naturally have sea legs I mean obviously you know with, 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 the, with the much larger vessels uh, the, the, the amount of uh, sway or roll or whatever mm. is, is, is much much lower but for me on small vessels I always find that I struggle mm. um, you know with the, with the small ferries that cross from Dover to Calais and things like that if that if that crossing's rough I, I, I struggle do you struggle or well, are was, you just naturally accustomed to I, this I was lucky I think uh, I, uh, I've i never been seasick and uh, right from that early age of 16 or 17 as a cadet um, we went through bad weather on the cargo ships and uh, I, I think I was lucky yeah um, I have known people at sea that do get seasick yeah. sometimes they don't get over it in their entire career and really? I admire them for sticking, sticking with it yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they really fantastic. Do. But um, as you say, the big ships like the big cruise line as well. For a start, if, if we're talking about going on cruising, one of the beauties of that career and that holiday or that vacation is that you generally go to nice parts of the world where there's yeah. good weather good weather so you're not going to have too rough a sea yeah. in the yeah. first place plus the ships are very big plus yeah. they're fully stabilized yeah. um but the queen mary too even more so because she was built for crossing the atlantic which let's face it is not actually known for being calm all the time mm. so mm. she was specially designed very very heavy very deep in the water uh, uh, with extra thick steel mm. so that she would just um, go through the seas and the weather. And I, I constantly had uh, guests uh, or passengers coming up to me and saying, Captain, I've been on many ships, but um, uh, the Queen Mary too just goes through the sea like nothing else. And I say, yeah, she was designed to do that because her main itinerary was going to be transatlantic crossings. So she was really very steady, very heavy, and uh, we uh, we rarely had people that were were feeling poorly, to be honest with you. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> well, I obviously have um, had the good fortune of being on the bridge of both uh, Queen Victoria and Queen Mary II. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, of Brilliant. course. <laughs> the one thing that I noticed when I was up there there was no steering wheel. Well, you say no. There is one, but it's so <laughs> small that you hardly notice it. Um, of course, everything now is uh, automated, you know, computer control, GPS, and so forth and so on. Uh, electronic charts, uh, no paper charts, like we used to spread out paper charts on a big chart table and plot our course in pencil. My understanding is that the, 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 the uh, cadets of today still have to learn the uh, paper chart. They do. Uh, way of navigating because it gives them the right grounding and if for instance any of that equipment would fail Quite. they still have that backup and that's the reason and the sextant as well even to use the sun and the stars to navigate so it's still there and um, it is as you say a backup and I think the uh, the Marine and Coast Guard Agency who um, awards certificates of competency will be very slow to, to ever take that out because yeah. you yeah. know um, electronic uh, equipment is fantastic but um, still the officers need to know a manual backup indeed if back. so there is a wheel yeah it is yeah. used okay um, when we're at sea we're on autopilot most of the time but coming into and out of port when we need uh, bigger variations in course 
uh, we do switch to the manual steering with a human helmsman at okay. the wheel. Okay, and this is fly-by-wire stuff, is that correct? Yes. So encoders in steering in, 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 in the little controls yeah. that effectively drive big servo systems That's downstairs really. in the engine room yeah. that then turn things. Because with the, with the ship 345 metres long, uh, uh, that's 1132 feet, if I'm not mistaken. 345 metres long. The, the uh, wheel is some 300 metres from where, from the... the from the controls, the, the, from, the, from the control from the surfaces. Engines, uh, the yeah. ASI pods, yeah. which yeah. we'll probably come on to. Um, so obviously that's a, it's fly by a very long wire. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed, very long wire, absolutely. <laughs> So, okay, yeah, and you mentioned Azipods. Give us a quick idea of, of, of um, how, um, a, a pick a, you know, you'll pick probably, the, let's pick the Queen Mary 2, perhaps, yeah. and yeah. give us a, a quick idea of, of, of the controls, the the drive systems that you have and mm. how you mm. how you navigate that, that uh, ship. Okay, so many cruise ships are what I would call, have standard propulsion, where which I would ter term that for having propellers and rudders. Indeed, um, so screw propellers yeah a bit like sir isambard kingdom brunel's one of the okay. first screw propeller ships that was steamship Indeed. admittedly yeah. the ss great britain That's so this one yeah. obviously isn't a steamship no. no but some of them will have that and others will have uh azipods as we mentioned which is a completely different system and one that i liked very much because it's more maneuverable mm -hmm. and that is literally the propellers are not on a propeller shaft they're on a pod that projects from the bottom of the ship at the aft or the stern mm -hmm. end, mm -hmm. and those pods can revolve 360 degrees in any direction. They have the propellers mounted on them, driven mm -hmm. by an electric motor. Mm -hmm. uh, so the diesel engines that we had on the ship to be to power the main propulsion actually only generate the electricity. They don't drive the propellers directly. They're, right. driven, they're driven by an electric motor and the pods can revolve 360 degrees. So essentially, you have the same power in any direction for when you're manoeuvring that ship. So if you're, if you're going forwards at um, 30 knots or whatever your top speed is, mm -hmm. is there a possibility that you could rotate those? No. And two settings, really. One yeah. is when you're manoeuvring in harbour when those pods can indeed independently revolve right. in any direction. Right. Uh, so the propeller is, is thrusting you in any direction you want but when you go out to sea they become much like standard propellers and rudders they are synchronized together yes. obviously driving yes. the ship ahead yes. and when the autopilot or indeed the the wheel mm -hmm. uh, makes a, an alteration in the angle they, they are synchronized understood yeah they understood. don't go independently then so they, so they so when you've got yeah. forward momentum there's something that says right okay Absolutely. we'll make sure that this all performs yeah. in, in, a, in a sensible yeah. manner. And in fact, yeah. you can manually switch that on the bridge. Yeah. Okay. So as you get the ship moving, yeah. using the manoeuvrability of the pods, yeah. once you're moving ahead, you switch into normal C mode. Yes. And those pods just, uh, they drive the ship ahead. Uh, and if they do angle, they angle uh, in sync with okay. each other. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bow thrusters. Bow thrusters as well. Well, that because the pods and the propellers we've talked about only control one end of the ship, really. Yes, indeed. The that's, that's at the, the stern, at the, the rear, the back. <laughs> the blunt end. The blunt not end, the not the sharp end. end. Yeah, at the okay. sharp end, yeah. we had uh, three bow thrusters, essentially uh, three tubes going right through the hull of the ship under the water with propellers centrally mounted in them, propellers which can go in either direction. In other words, pumping the water through those tubes uh, either that way or that way depending on where you want the thrust. They act in sync, the three of them, and the total, and, and I controlled those with a little joystick, and it, it even used to scare me because that joystick controlled 13,000 horsepower. That's a lot of horsepower. Yeah. But then when you've, got, when you've got a ship that, 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 that's that big, I'm sure you must need quite a lot of horsepower. Yeah. But basically then at the, at the bow of the ship, at the front of the ship, running um, axially to the front of the ship are these propellers which will give you the ability to be able to manoeuvre the front of the ship left and right. Yes. Or yep. port and starboard. Port and starboard. <laughs> okay, come on, tell us. Port and starboard. Where, how do you, how, <laughs> where did it come from? How do, how do I remember which is port and which is starboard? Well, I don't know. I mean, when I was learning, the, the, I found a trick that worked for me is that the port and left both have four letters in the word. Okay. So that's fairly... Yeah. I need something simple. Well, that's really simple. I like that. So yeah. port is left. Port is left. 
left and starboard is right. Uh, where did it come from? Because on ancient ships, um, they they didn't before they invented a rudder. They used to steer by a kind of huge long oar, and that always went out on the right hand side, and that was the steering board side. Can you see where I'm going? Okay. Steering board starboard. became starboard. Some say that the port became port because with this dirty great oar on the on the starboard side, the only side that the boat could come alongside in port was on that side. Because, because that, was, otherwise that would get in the way. It was clear it didn't, didn't foul the didn't oar. Foul so the that ink. may or may not be true, but okay. that's where port and starboard came from. Indeed. Originally. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's a really good tip. So four letters, left, port. That's an easy one. Um, yeah. There's one thing, as we are on your dubious engineering, and I'm not an engineer, however, we're talking about the bow thrusters moving the bow. Of course, that's only when you're manoeuvring, when the ship is almost stationary. Yes. Um, as soon as you start uh, moving ahead, your, your axle of rotation um, moves to the bow of the ship. So I would say ships steer a bit like a supermarket trolley. Okay. With a rudder or azipods at the stern, yeah. you're steering like a supermarket trolley, really. Yeah. If you tried to use those bow thrusters when you were already doing, say, 10 or 15 or even 20 knots, you are not going to push the bow to one side or the other because of the way the ship's going through the, the water and the fact that the angle of the rotation, has, uh, the axle, has... Um, it's gone right forward. Okay. So ultimately, then, when you're when you're up to speed, those bow thrusters become redundant. You switch them off switch straight away, off. and you steer yeah. the ship with the rudders, or if you have fitted with azipods, with the azipods. Yeah. Excellent yeah. stuff. So um, there's some amazing statistics mm. about um, as well. Both both of the both the Queen Mary and also the Queen Victoria, Queen Mary too. Sorry, um, but um, we've got a few of those statistics written down. Uh, I'm going to grab them here and uh some of this some of this may may indeed make you smile eight thousand eight hundred loudspeakers on board i love my music fantastic i had a honda accord once that had 22 <laughs> speakers in it <laughs> Not quite 8,800. Not quite 8,800 lights. But that is for 2,600 people. That's, yeah, they're fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, 3,000 telephones. Apparently. 3,000 telephones. They all um, used to seem to ring me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hello, switchboard. Um, 8,350 automatic fire extinguishers. Yeah. Yeah, ah. a lot of a lot of stuff. I mean, the sheer scale of these ships is uh, is almost mind-boggling. Really, they are like a little town, um, yeah, floating on the sea. It's it's a massive ho it, exactly. I, I'm trying to th think of it as a hotel, but it's it's, it's a it has the services yeah. of a hotel. Yeah. but but it's a town. I mean, I don't know of any hotels that have. I'm sure there must be some out there, but that can accommodate that many people and serve that many people dinner. Nearly, in, you know, in, in in the space of two or three hours. So, just quickly thinking. remind us how many people can you fit? How many customers can you fit on board uh, the Queen Mary two? Two thousand six hundred. Two thousand six hundred customers. Give or take um, is is the usual figure, and we're we're nearly always full. Yeah, uh, and uh, looking after those. Uh, number of people uh, there was also additional 1,800 crew members or so that's yeah, almost so as many crew ratio. members as, as there are you know that's fantastic so, exactly. yeah, really. yeah so it yeah. is like a little town you have to have yeah. absolutely everything from all the food storage the food preparation the, all the cleaning uh, we make our own fresh water as we go along yes um, indeed so desalination plants desalination plants working off yeah. the heat yeah. of the engines so actually a little on the engines we had four huge huge 16 cylinder uh, diesels um, to generate all that electricity we were talking about earlier um, and it's such a flexible system that you have electric propulsion because all you need to figure out at any time at least all the chief engineer had to figure out at any time was how much electricity do you need to generate you need to generate enough power to do the speed that you want to do 
and enough power to generate the entire hotel and all the services. Which I'm, I'm sure that the hotel and services is probably going to be a relatively stable number. So I guess it's just when you suddenly turn around yeah. and say, right, we need to increase our speed, please. Yes. Um, he then has to think about, or he then talks to the computer that has to think about <laughs> how much exactly. it's How many engines do we need? Do we need two, three or four? That's magnificent. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, you're, yeah. you may be, I don't want to preempt things, but no, please. The Queen Mary 2 was unique, really, in that we also had the backup of two gas turbines as well, uh, which she was uh, fitted with to really to uh, save space, uh, because uh, a gas turbine, as you know, fits on the wing of an aeroplane, whereas uh, indeed. the diesel engines that we had four of were the size of a huge house each. Yes, yes, so yes. Um, the gas turbines, however, uh, were very very efficient at producing vast quantities of electricity, mm. but of course very expensive to Not run. Not economical to run. No, yeah, yeah, no. okay. But we used them when we needed them. Yes, indeed, yeah. So um, just again, just sort of quick statistics point then. Uh, approximately, when you would go to, um, to port to refuel, Approximately, how much fuel did you have mm. to put in? You know, when I take my car to the to the gas station, as, as uh, to when I take my car to the petrol station, um, I, I maybe costs me between sixty and eighty pounds. This is uh, two thousand and nineteen now, by the way. <laughs> so it's, it's about you know sixty yeah. or eighty, you know, Great British pounds. So how much does it cost you to fill your tanks? A little bit more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we would uh, usually fuel up with around 2,000 tonnes of fuel every two weeks wow. or so, sometimes 2,500 tonnes even depending what we needed, where we were going. Um, I believe the bill for that kind of uh, fuel up is around $1.5 million uh, per go. So um, she uses a lot of fuel um, but uh, she's a big ship and yes. she carries a lot of people. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got some fun facts about the Queen Mary too, actually. We've talked about how big she is and uh, there's some amazing statistics. I've, I've put a few together. Maybe people would be interested. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Okay. So, tell us. Yeah. Well, first yeah. of all, uh, Cunard's first ever ship was called the Britannia and she was around 230 feet in length. She okay. came across the Atlantic as well. 230 feet, let's yeah. just convert that back to metres, so less than 100 metres, 80. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 80 metres or 80, so. 70 metres. And yeah. a fun fact is that she could actually fit inside the Queen Mary too, and probably most of her would actually fit in the grand ballroom of the Queen Mary too. That's so amazing. that just gives you an idea of the scale. Yeah. Uh, she's 147 feet longer than the Eiffel Tower, Wow, Paris. Um, <laughs> she's only 117 feet shorter than the Empire State Building. Can you imagine? Um, so, which is 1,248 feet and uh, 1,132 feet for the uh, Queen Mary II. Um, her her whistles, her main ship's whistles that we blow when we're leaving port or, or to attract someone's attention, they're so big they can be heard for up to 10 miles really? in still conditions. They, really? They, they really make the passengers jump that are out on the open deck when we sound those. <laughs> are they, are they steam-powered or...? or well, they're, they're air. Sorry, they're air, 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 air. Yeah, stupid question, are they steam-powered? They, they, Obviously not. Yeah, the yeah. original Queen Mary um, we was uh, had steam-powered whistles and and on Queen Mary 2, the modern version, we, we were lucky enough to actually inherit one of the Queen Mary's original whistles. She, she now, incidentally, is a, a museum um, birth permanently near Los Angeles. And, uh, operating well, as a hotel and museum. Yeah, 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 well worth a visit. Yeah. So um, we actually were able to obtain one of her original whistles, which was a steam whistle, but converted it to be electric air compressor powered. And so so, so my have... question wasn't as silly as it sounded. No. <laughs> we, the sound that that whistle makes yeah. is quite impressive. Oh, I bet, yeah. 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 There we go. Superb. And, and effectively those are just resonating cavities yeah. it's amazing isn't it yeah, yeah. just yeah. pumping air through it and, right. and, and a big horn a big horn yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so so you use those um uh, when it's foggy conditions we do they double up as the fog horns yeah. uh, we uh, attract 
attract uh, other vessels' attention if we need to. Yes. And uh, we use them a lot as fun, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. When we're sailing out of port, it's always yeah. lovely to give a long blast on yes. the whistle. Yeah. Um, usually returned by some of the other ships that are in port as well. Have you ever had to attract any vessels' attention in the past? Um, everything happens, yeah. Certain <laughs> people uh, or ships don't uh, perhaps abide by the rules that they should be. So yeah, you use yeah. every means that you yeah, need to. If yeah. it's night, you flash uh, an incredibly powerful uh, searchlight uh, at them, or right. you could blow a whistle. Uh, certainly for uh, what we used it for mostly, for instance, coming out of Southampton, as you may know, it's a very popular sailing port. And so in the summer, you'd have a lot of sailing boats here, there, and everywhere. And we used to sound the whistle to let them know uh, in no uncertain terms that we were that coming you were there. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, question for you. Um, uh, what's the difference between a boat and a ship? Ah, yeah, it's always a good one. And the best answer I ever heard was, you can put a boat on a ship, but you <laughs> cannot <laughs> put a ship on on a boat so lifeboat on board a ship exactly right. and that's as uh, definitive as i'm going to go anyway. no that's that's brilliant yeah <laughs> excellent you have a massive anchor <laughs> on board ship don't you we do <laughs> two <laughs> two do, do you have one at the front and one at the rear no both at the front both at the, both front. At the sharp end uh, yeah. do, do you you i mean we when do you use when them. do you take a, 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 a vessel like this and 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 what do you call it? Just anchor out, out of anchor we, we, out of, well, out we of do. port. Um, there's some ports we go to when we're not doing the um, transatlantic between Southampton and New York. We do general cruising, and we do go to some ports which uh, we like to take passengers in on our ship's tenders because the port's too small for a ship the size of Queen Mary two to berth in. So we anchor outside the port, and we actually transport the guests in and out on our ship's tenders. We run a, a ferry operation. A ferry operation yeah, usually to the port. Uh, very nicely done as well um, but yeah the anchors are there and anyway every ship has to have an anchor in case of a total breakdown okay uh, which yes. can happen yeah fair enough um, yeah. you yeah. need yeah. to if you're in shallow enough water right. be able to anchor the ship safely so she's not yeah. going to drift anywhere while that repair's being made or whatever hopefully that doesn't happen often yes. but nevertheless it's a requirement for every ship to have a, yeah. an anchor that can hold it now big ship um, big anchor 20 <laughs> 23 tons each 23 of, uh, tons. of actual you know cast solid steel, steel. yeah, um, yeah. and uh, but it and many people think it's dropping the anchor onto the seabed that holds the ship in its position it's not it's the anchor cable or chain that you lay out along the seabed that holds the ship the anchor m does does Help. provide a, yeah. an anchorage, obviously, yeah. Yeah. but mainly to lay that chain out. So Queen Mary 2, we had up to 770 metres of incredibly huge anchor cable. So you initially drop the anchor, then you take the ship astern slowly, laying out a tremendous length of cable along the seabed, and that's what holds the ship in position, actually. And the anchor chain length is over 700... Yeah, 770 metres in total. Unbelievable, and it's so very big change. That well. itself must weigh way more Absolutely. than the anchor itself. M much yeah. more, yeah, yeah, yeah. much yeah. more. Than and the anchor. again, um, must be um, a servo, big, big servo, big motors huge, inside. Huge. The we call them uh, windlasses, windlasses. Uh, which is uh, another okay. word for a, a winch, if you yeah. like. And yeah. it's a windlass that uh, picks up that anchor cable. Okay. Uh, yeah. A huge electric motor. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, has to be factored in when you're heaving up your anchor. You need that extra electric power to really uh, generate. Turn on another, turn on another generator. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. There's always more available. Yeah, yeah, yeah excellent. Um, so some of the things that I, I remember um, some time ago, you did a trip uh, through the Amazon. Yes, on Queen Victoria. On Queen Victoria. Yeah. So switching ships mm -hmm. to the Queen Victoria. That, to me, seemed like a very significant sort of point um, in... Please tell us. In my career. I was going to, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. because we were the biggest ship to ever navigate the Amazon. I mean, let's stop and think, first of all. Um, Queen Victoria, we say she's smaller than the Queen Mary II. She's still a huge ship. She's still 290 metres in length. Yeah. Uh, and 2,000 guests and um, 1,200, 1,300 crew. Uh, a huge ship. And um, it was realised that we could make history um, because it was possible in the wet season when the depths in the Amazon increased by 10 or 20 feet 
uh, over the, what they are in the dry season, uh, it was possible to navigate Queen Victoria all the way up the Amazon to the, almost to the source uh, where actually two rivers combine to form the Amazon itself. That happens at a city in the Brazilian jungle called Manaus. And that's the port we went to. We went to the port of Manaus in Brazil. It's an incredible 900 miles up the river Amazon from the sea. When you look on the map, you've taken that ocean-going liner almost into the centre of the South American continent. It, it's so far in. 900 miles. Uh, it took us three to four days from the sea to get to Manaus. We did have the help of um, local expert Amazonian pilots who okay. know uh, the river uh, very intricately, and um, they were they were great. But uh, it was uh, a fascinating uh, and different um, period of, of navigation uh, going that far up a river with such a large such, such a large, large vessel. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we had to factor in, of course, that going up the river to Manaus, we were going against the river flow, which was anything from three to four knots, oh, which was a big factor. That's, that's quite a flow as well. Quite yeah. a flow. Yeah. And um, when we were coming back out towards the sea, we had that extra three or four knots with us as well. So um, <laughs> it was pro propelling us along even faster. But the, the statistics about the Amazon are, are mind-boggling. I, I don't have them all to hand, but it is many, many, many times bigger than any other river in the world. One, one that made my mind boggle was that the estuary of the river where it meets the ocean, um, you don't know that you've even left the ocean because the estuary is 200 miles across. Oh. Uh, you, the, you cannot... You can't the, see the, no, the, the shore. You can't see yeah. the shore at all. Yeah, yeah. So you have to, yeah. on your electronic charts, you're proceeding into the river, but uh, it's so wide at that point. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't even realise you're in a river, except for the change of colour of the water. Really? Uh, and it went a very brown, muddy colour. Then, then you were in the river. Then you knew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so um, obviously the, the Amazon then um, is shallower, which segway, segues me nicely onto my next question. Mm. Ships draft. Mm. Now, I, I didn't realise that ships had a draft <laughs> uh, until I met you. I've learned a lot from you as time has gone by. Um, so a question for you. What is a ship's draft? Yeah, well, it's not the draft when you get a cold air blowing yeah. uh, a ship's draft is the amount of the ship itself which is under the water uh, so the distance from the water line to the very bottom of the ship which is called the keel so let's give you an example the Queen Mary 2 as I mentioned earlier is sits very deep in the water to help her be comfortable through bad weather so she has a draft which is around 10 meters around uh, 32 feet I think so all that amount of the ship is under the water line uh, inside the ship of course that's where you have all your fuel tanks and your engines and probably your waste handling centers and laundries and things like that they are actually below the water line in, in the hull of the ship but um, uh, it's that that um, keeps the ship stable um, clearly when you think about the, how much of the ship there is above the water mm. and you do wonder how mm. she stays Mm. stable the right way up the right way up uh, indeed, because yeah, yeah. although 10 meters yeah. below the water is a lot yeah there's over there's 50 meters yes. above the water yes indeed that's to the top of the so mast completely the opposite way around yeah. to an iceberg yes <laughs> so clearly the ship is designed yeah. to have the center of gravity in a very low position so all the way to those engines those fuel tanks fresh water tanks and we even have extra tanks that we can fill or empty with seawater ballast ballast tanks yeah. okay yeah. and that's yeah. all to do with keeping the center of gravity down low enough to keep the ship stable, stable. yeah yes. definitely yeah. fantastic so we the draft is very important for us when we're planning where we can go and mm -hmm. where we can't go yeah um mostly in port or indeed in rivers such yeah. as the amazon yeah. because clearly we have to have a uh, an acceptable clearance beneath between the bottom of the ship yeah. and the seabed or the riverbed and uh, that that should be at least you know two or three meters uh, but when we're in the middle of the atlantic ocean of course um, sometimes we're we're up to five thousand meters in depths of water, you know. Yeah, incredible, incredible amount incredible of water. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, how did you start in your line of work? How did I go to sea first? Well, it started I started as a sixteen-year-old. I don't know how I did it, but I went off to sea at sixteen, and I, I put it down mostly to growing up next to the sea in Folkestone in Kent uh, on the English Channel. And uh, of course, in those days, uh, Folkestone was a ferry port. Uh, the ferries used to run to Boulogne in France. 
Uh, unfortunately, it's closed now, but I suppose with the Channel Tunnel, really, uh, taking all the tray. But um, from an early age, I used to watch the ferries uh, manoeuvring outside the port of Folkestone, you know, and uh, a dream that they'd uh, imagine that they'd just come all the way from France and uh, they would turn around outside the harbour, manoeuvring with their engines, and they would come astern, that's backing into the harbour and berth. And I always used to, I remember thinking, first of all, I wonder if ships have brakes, you know, but I quickly realised they don't. But um, it was that general fascination of watching the ship's manoeuvre uh, that I thought, yeah, I want to, I want to drive a ship like that. You want to be part of this. Yeah. yeah superb. Yeah. yeah. So what, what happened next then? Did you go to a college? Uh, no, I had to do a lot of research to find out what exactly I did have to do, really. Um, um, yes, I did go to a college, but initially I, I went through what was then known as the British Shipping Federation, and they put me in touch with all the different British shipping companies. And uh, basically, um, as, as early as 16, before I'd done my O-levels, I went for interviews. Um, I remember my father taking me, and I probably went to five or six interviews with different shipping companies and uh, got an offer of work with, uh, with two of them and chose the one I thought um, seemed the nicest company. All I had to do was get my O-levels and they would take me on as a navigating cadet. Uh, there was a choice. I could have gone as an engineering cadet. I know we're here on dubious engineering. <laughs> um, however, when I found that you could actually, if you went engineering, the highest you could get was chief engineer. Okay. To get to be captain, you had to go through the navigating side of things so i became a navigating cadet officer so you had in your mind then when you started your career you had captain in your set in your targets yeah i guess i did yeah, yeah definitely yeah, i thought well there's no point in doing it if you don't end up as a captain really <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, yeah what was I, I, and i do apologize if my terminology is incorrect but no. what was your first um your your first command then if you like well, for, well first of all you have to go up the ranks mm -hmm. of, of officerdom you know so mm -hmm. as i say i started as a, a cadet that meant time at college as you previously said uh, as well as time on ships so it was mixed uh, and it just culminated in taking uh, a lot of exams and uh, after the three years if you passed all your exams you were awarded a certificate of competency to be an officer on uh, an ocean going ship and, and in those days, I wasn't on the passenger ships, I was on cargo ships and even oil tankers. So um, it's a great feeling when you get your license, you know, you can uh, be the officer of the watch, as they call it, on the bridge of a ship. Um, and of course, they're huge things, you know, even the cargo ships. So uh, even then, I was only 21 and um, driving ma massive ships around the world for a living. I, I seriously used to stand on the bridge of those ships and uh, on a sunny day at sea in the ocean and think, I can't believe they're really paying me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoyed it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you start as a third officer and then you work up to second officer, first officer, and then uh, eventually uh, a deputy captain and captain. What an amazing man, what a, an amazing experience, and thank you so much for coming on the show and taking the time to it's chat with us. Oh, absolutely, it's been interesting. There's no shadow of a doubt there. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to hear answered, perhaps we can have another go at this at some point in the future and absolutely. make a little follow-up video. Yes. Um, so that yeah. would be quite, uh, quite good fun. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section down below. Obviously, don't forget to give us a good old thumbs up and don't don't forget to subscribe for more on Dubious Engineering on YouTube. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, it's Dawn Marie. Hello, Howard. The captain's <laughs> wife. <laughs> but actually, what's incredible, she's also my sister, but what's incredible here is Dawn is also a captain. Well, I am. You, but I sorry, was. a captain, I say, a pilot, <laughs> actually, weren't you? That's right. Yes, indeed. So Yeah, I had my private pilot's licence for 23 years, but not just on single-engine aeroplanes, it was on multi-aeroplanes. So, so twin, uh, twin engine, twin engine, ILS rated, if I remember correctly. ILS rated, yes. well, it's IMC rated. IMC rated. And um, that meant I could fly above the clouds on, you know, or I had my night rating, I could fly on an evening. And I was also a, a member of the Royal Aero Club for many years, air racing. <laughs> so um, I'm not just the typical little sister, am I, really? No, you're, you're incredible, <laughs> incredible, incredible. Yeah. 
Well, big sister, actually. <laughs> Little in, sta in, in physical stature, but, but bigger because you, you popped out before I did. Uh, so uh, Now, one thing that Dawn has... Um, now, Dawn has retired as well. Um, early retirement. Early retirement as well. And um, one thing that Dawn started doing when you were cruising some time ago is yes. you started doing some paintings, didn't you? I took some painting classes on board the Queen Victoria. And this is what I used to do in my time on board. And uh, it was watercolour. Um, I had my O-level when I was at school. Um, and then I didn't paint for many years, lost the plot, but took these lessons. And this is what I've been doing recently. And I'll tell you what, some of them are absolutely fantastic. Now, you've got a website. I Sorry, have. Yeah, and your website is? Well, that is www.ipaintyourcat.com, doing portraits, basically, of cats. But one or two dogs have come along also. So perfect uh, opportunity to get some of the cats that... Obviously, this isn't a portrait of somebody's cat. And this was an idea off um, the internet I had it, just to get me going. Really striking eyes and very, very colourful, very interesting, very beautiful piece of artwork. And really well done. The time that you put into these is magnificent. You know, some of your artwork really is very, very, very good. Another uh, painting of ships here, slightly more modern contemporary style sort of um, uh, and this one has been stamped on the Queen Mary 2 and signed by Captain Peter Philpott my husband which is magnificent <laughs> so pop on over and we'll obviously we'll put some of these pictures in close ups there's a ballerina here that's absolutely beautiful as well um, and, and you know as you say you've got some these are, the, these are just copies because the originals have been sold yeah. these, these were portraits that people sent to me and I painted their, their portraits. And you have a Facebook um, site as well called... Um, Artworks by Dawn Marie. Artworks by Dawn Marie. And, and is this somebody's cat here? Yes, it is. Uh, that's um, Toffee. And uh, it's a friend's cat. And she asked me to paint um, two of her cats, which I've just done recently. Really, really yes. beautiful paintings. Thank so, you. if you have a cat or a dog, or you want something painted, perhaps get in touch with Dawn on ipaintyourcat.com. Yes, correct. And artworks by Dawn Marie on Facebook. Thanks, everybody. Okay, actually, I've forgotten to do this. <laughs> but I just want to say, and I know it's only. I know you're going to laugh at this. Yeah, it's a booby prize. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for being on Dubious Engineering. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Amazing. It's, it's a white box. It's a white box. You've always wanted a white. You've always wanted an empty white box. Yeah. What's yeah. in the box? Oh. Dubious Engineering. Oh, that's brilliant. Mug. We're going to be fighting over this now. Yeah, there's only one. I only had the one oh, left. That's fantastic. That will take pride of place. Thank you very much. That will be my morning coffee. Excuse morning me, coffee. am I not in yours? <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, Thank guys. You. Don't forget to subscribe. Cheers. 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 Engineering. <laughs>